Chapter 8. Young Pilots. Telephone for me? Pete asked in surprise. Who is it? He didn't say. Pete picked up the phone. Hello, this is Pete Hollister. Hi, Pete. This is Jack Moore. I'm having a swell time. How about you? Nifty. Have you been to Mystery Mountain yet? No, Jack answered soberly. Nobody here has ever heard of it. And we haven't found the book that was stolen, so we don't know where to look. That's too bad, said Pete. Maybe something will turn up. Oh, we have plenty to do, Jack told him. A lot of sheep are missing from Bishop's Ranch, and we've been out looking for them. Pete whistled. Honestly? That's just what happened at Cottonwood. We think we're on the trail of them, though. Maybe ours are in the same place. Mr. Bishop thinks they were rustled. Same here. And we suspect Mesquite Mike, said Pete. Have you found out where he lives? No, but listen to this. Helen and I got a note from Willie Boot. What? Pete exclaimed. Yes, he said he didn't want us to go home thinking he was the one who had ruined Pedro and the donkey at the fiesta. It was somebody else. I don't believe it, Pete exclaimed. Neither do we. But Willie said somebody else on the school roof was responsible, Jack went on. He wouldn't tell on him, he said. Pete wanted to give Willie Booth the benefit of the doubt, but he found it hard to swallow the story and said so. Well, let's forget him, said Jack. Say, Pete, how about your coming over here sometime? Sure, I'll ask my folks and give you a call. And bring Pam. Helen says to say hello. Well, I have to go now. So long. Be seeing you. You bet. Goodbye. Pete told the others what he had learned, and all of them were puzzled about Willie Boot. While they were discussing him, the group heard a car approaching. It's Dad, Dolores cried, and ran out to meet him. Diego followed, and their father had hardly stopped before the boy was telling them about the sheep tracks and the clue of the hat that seemed to point to Mesquite Mike as the rustler. Don't you think you ought to notify the police? Diego asked. I will, Mr. Vega replied. It's a fine suggestion. All the ranchers have felt for a long time that Mesquite Mike wasn't honest, but we had no idea he'd taken to rustling. Mr. Vega went at once to the telephone and reported his son's suspicions. Then, returning to his family in the Hollisters, he said, I believe I'll do a little sleuthing in my plane after lunch. Anybody want to go? There was a chorus of, oh yes, from the children. Mrs. Hollister laughed. I'm sure there's not room for all of you in the plane. We'd better let Mr. Vega choose his passengers. The ranch owner smiled. It'll be a tight squeeze, but I believe I can fit all seven of them in, he told her. Goody, shouted Sue, who had been fearful that she would be left out. After lunch, everyone went outside to see the searchers take off in Mr. Vega's plane. Pam was sorry that there was not room for her father to go along. Walking up to him, she put a hand on his arm. Dad, she said, wouldn't you like to ride in my place? That's nice of you, dear, he said, touched by her generosity. But you join the others. I don't mind staying here. Pam was not going to give up so easily. You like to ride horseback, she said. Wouldn't you and Truchess like to search on the ground? Fine idea, Mr. Hollister laughed. It'll do me good to get some exercise. When do we start? Ricky asked impatiently. Right away, if you're ready, was the reply. The children raced to the barn. Opening the big door, they pushed the airplane out and wheeled it into a nearby field, which Mr. Vega used for his runway. The children climbed into the plane. Mr. Vega entered last and closed the door. He sat in the pilot seat and started the engine. His passengers' eager faces peered out of the windows and they waved goodbye. The airship taxied down the homemade runway and then headed about into the wind. Here we go, Mr. Vega said as he gave it the throttle. The engine roared as the craft sped across the field, then rose gently into the air. Diego sat in a chair alongside his father. The others took places back of him, with Sue on Pam's lap and Holly on Dolores's. P 
Pete and Ricky occupied the rear seats. As the plane circled over the ranch, Mr. Vega asked the boys to guide him to the spot where they'd seen the sheep tracks. It was not far from the river, Diego told him. As the ship sped toward the spot, the boy reached into a compartment alongside the seat and pulled out a pair of powerful binoculars. There, I think we're over the place now, he said. Mr. Vega swooped lower while his son scanned the ground with his glasses. He could see no sign of the sheep tracks. Are you sure this is the spot? Mr. Vega asked as he banked the plane and headed over the territory again. Yes, this is right, Pete spoke up. I remember that formation of juniper trees. But there are no tracks down there now, Diego insisted. Do you suppose, said Pam, that the storm last night washed away the tracks? Pam, you're a good sleuth, said Mr. Vega. Your guess is perfect. We'll have to give up hunting for the tracks. Well, I'll show you Hollister's our ranch. What a thrilling sight it was to look down over the vast countryside. The pinion bushes looked like tiny little blobs of green against the sandy soil. And though the plain was high now, the mountains in the distance loomed still higher. I'll give you all a look at one of our herds, Mr. Vega said. The children kept their eyes glued to the ground, but in a few minutes, Pete turned to look toward Mr. Vega. He gave a whistle of surprise and all the others gazed ahead. Diego was in the pilot's seat, his hands firmly holding the wheel. Crickets, Pete exclaimed. I didn't know you could pilot a plane, Diego. Diego kept his eyes straight ahead and replied without turning his head. Sure, dad taught me how to fly this plane and when I'm old enough, I'm gonna get a pilot's license. Mr. Vega explained that children were allowed to fly airplanes over uninhabited territory as long as an experienced pilot was with them. Could I have a turn? Ricky proposed. If you're very careful and do as I say, Mr. Vega answered. But first we'll let Diego keep the wheel for five minutes. The boy flew the plane like a veteran. When the time was up, his father said, all right, Diego, we'll let the Hollisters have their turns now. Who will be first? Can Pam try? Pete asked. Sure enough. Come on up here, Pam. The girl rose and made her way to the front of the plane. Mr. Vega steadied the wheel as she seated herself. Keep the nose level with the horizon, he instructed her. Don't hold on to the wheel as if it were a bucking bronc. Pam was a bit fearful, but she tried to do exactly as Mr. Vega had told her. The plane, however, did not fly as it had for Diego. First, the nose went down a little and Pam pulled back on the wheel. Then the nose rose again, but too sharply. Hey, Pam, you're giving us a roller coaster ride, Ricky shouted. This is fun, Holly declared gleefully but be sure you don't fly us up to the moon, Pam. This made her sister giggle so hard that the wheel jiggled and the plane wobbled a bit. Mr. Vega took it, saying, you did very well for your first try, Pam. I think you will make a very good pilot. Ricky, how about you? The red-haired boy scrambled up to the pilot's seat, but he could not hold the plane completely level either. Although it did not go up and down so sharply as it had for Pam, it felt like a children's roller coaster. Okay, Holly, you're next, Mr. Vega said, smiling at the pigtailed girl. Holly did as well as her brother. Then it was Pete's turn. The boy had observed Diego very carefully and tried to imitate him. You're doing swell, Diego said admiringly as Pete guided the plane smoothly. After he had been at the controls for about three minutes, Mr. Vega reached back for Sue Lifting her forward, he took the pilot seat and held the little girl on his lap. Now put your hands on the wheel, he told her. Sue did this, but bounced up and down in the seat as if she were on horseback, and all the children laughed. Just as Sue's turn was over, Dolores said, look up ahead, that's one of our flocks. On the slope of the hillside could be seen a good sized patch of white. How many sheep are in that flock, Pete asked. About a thousand. And one herder takes care of all of them? A herder and a cook, Diego replied. 
and they have five burrows to carry their supplies. Mr. Vega banked the plane and flew low over the flock. Two men standing near them waved their hats and the children waved back. Why do you raise your sheep so far from your home? Pam asked. Mr. Vega explained that there was not water enough for good pasture closer to the ranch house. The flocks had to be taken far down the range and up on the hillside where the vegetation was lush in the summer. As they flew back, Pete asked if he might use the glasses. A mountain they were passing suddenly looked to him like the sketch of Mystery Mountain in Helen and Jack Moore's old book. Could this be it? He asked Mr. Vega what the name of the mountain was. Around here we call it Serpent Peak, but I guess it's had many names over a period of years. About halfway back to the ranch house, Holly took the binoculars and scanned the ground below them. All at once she cried out, look, I see something moving down there. Maybe it's the lost sheep. Mr. Vega circled the plane. Something was moving about in a pinion thicket. He found a strip of open ground and brought the plane down in a long glide. But as the wheels touched the earth, suddenly a frightened dogie dashed from the pinion thicket and ran directly in front of the plane. Look out, the children screamed. Mr. Vega swerved the plane sharply. He missed the young calf who scampered off but his craft skidded directly toward the edge of a deep arroyo. We're gonna crash into it, Pam shrieked. 